some PMs are just going to suck. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's part of the job. So we're going to talk about vacuum pumps. Coming up next, right here on Better Biomed. Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today we're gonna to be talking about vacuum pumps. Why would I make a video about vacuum pumps? Well, it's quite simple. I recently had a work order on a device and it was actually a liposuction machine and this device had intermittent vacuum. In fact, you could hear the tone difference of the motor and the load on the motor when you flick it off, flick it on randomly. Now, what would cause a random intermittent error with a vacuum pump? because you either usually have vacuum or you don't. But come to find out by the end of this video, you too will realize that there is a probable situation where you're gonna have intermittent vacuum that you can fix quite easily. So stay tuned until the end and we'll get there. Now let's start out with the basics, all right? There are four basic types of vacuum pumps that you're gonna run into in medical equipment. I know there's more than four types of vacuum pumps. Shut up! That's okay. We've got four basic types that we're gonna run into. Four, okay? So stay with me. The first type is gonna be your diaphragm pumps. All right, these are the ones that have a little rubber disc that will flex in and out, and it's got two little reed valves that go up and down. A reed valve is a little flapper. It's a little piece of metal, like, like this guy here can see that there's a reed valve right there and there's one on the back those are called flapper valves or reed valves so diaphragm pumps will have a rubber disc that pushes in and out and the little reed valves will control the airflow in and out of the chamber they're cheap to produce they're based on rpm of the motor so the higher the rpm obviously the higher vacuum that you're able to pull but there's a couple things that you have to know. Diaphragm pumps are the least efficient type of vacuum pump. And they are generally very cheap to maintain. They're easy, so that's why most people use them. There's another huge factor on diaphragm pumps for you guys. You're gonna find these, these little diaphragm pumps all the time in compact suction units. Why is that? Well, not only are they cheap and light and easy to maintain, but can handle liquids. And if you think about it, a compact suction unit, what are the odds during a trauma situation that your vacuum reservoir overflows and some of that liquid gets back into the pump? It's possible. And there are some pumps that that would completely destroy. Whereas with a diaphragm pump, you just rebuild it and press on, you're good. So they are the most common type of pump. You will see them absolutely everywhere. I find them all the time in portable suction units. Remember guys, diaphragms are a consumable. You can buy replacements. Now when you go to buy replacement diaphragms, one of the things that you guys should realize, when you guys work on any type of plumbing or any type of device that has consumables, get yourself a set of these. This is a caliper. All right, they're very inexpensive. You can get them for about 10 to $20. Some of the more expensive ones are about two to $300. You don't need those. This is a cheap Chinese set. And I built this entire CNC here with this guy, this little $10 set. It's very precise, especially for what you need. And the reason that you need one of these is not only to measure O-rings, the diameter of O-rings and the width of an O-ring, You'll also use this here to measure your diaphragm width because you don't always have to buy a diaphragm for a diaphragm pump from the OEM because they're probably not going to sell it. All right, guys, you're going to find diaphragms for a diaphragm pump on the open market. They're out there. You don't have to go to OEM for everything. You just have to remember the diaphragm material is going to be dependent on the substance that's being pumped. Sometimes you'll have uh, air, which will just be a rubber diaphragm. Sometimes you will have flammables, 
and diaphragm pumps will have like a silicone type of diaphragm. But once you figure out the material that you are using, usually rubber, you then measure the diameter with a set of calipers and you can find it on the open market. I know a lot of you guys fear buying stuff on the open market, but believe it or not, pumps, vacuum pumps specifically, are not usually made by the OEM, all right? They're made by some other company, OEM, rebrands it. So you can find these parts on the open market. Okay guys, let's move on to the second type of pump. That would be this guy. This would be a piston or wobble piston pump. Piston pumps are very low maintenance. They have a little piston that moves up and down and you have a reed valve right here. You're gonna find this is gonna be a very common trait with vacuum pumps. If you take a look here, I actually have one because I like taking vacuum pumps apart. This right here is the cylinder that the little wobble piston moves back and forth in. And here you can see the wobble piston. See how it just flops back and forth? And let's see if I can pull it up. If you can see the cross section of it, it's oval. That's because as this guy goes back and forth, it doesn't completely seat against the walls. It teeters back and forth inside the cavity and it depends on really high RPMs to maintain a suction. Now there are some huge advantages to these pumps. There is almost no parts to replace. When you do a PM on one of these bad boys, what you're gonna do is you're gonna check it for vacuum. You're gonna completely occlude the, the device and then you're gonna check the vacuum. And if you aren't able to pull 20 to 25 inches of mercury, you're going to pull it apart and you're going to take a look at this guy right here. These little flapper or reed valves, they get dirty. You just take it off. You can see right there, flathead screw. Again, industrial device. These guys right here, you can find these reed valves on the open market. It's just a common, common part. There's an O-ring that sits here in this groove. If your O-rings are good and your flapper valves are cleaned, the pump should generate a pretty reasonable vacuum. So that is a wobble piston pump, or just a piston pump, whatever you want to call it. The piston pumps, if you can tell, this guy here, it can handle, because it's a piston, it's a solid object moving uh, to and fro inside the cylinder, it can actually create a pretty high vacuum, but it doesn't have a high flow rate because it would have to run really, really fast. And the faster you run it, the more friction and you generate heat and a bunch of other stuff. This little pump's running its heart out, teetering inside the cylinder. You don't want it run at extremely high RPMs, but it's going to run reasonably high. The next type of pump, the one that led to the making of this video, rotary vein pumps. Now, what is a rotary vein pump? A rotary vein pump has a motor and at the tip of the motor is a cylinder that's got little grooves cut into it and there are veins that ride inside the grooves. Now these veins will sometimes have support springs and some of the springs will be a bow spring which is just a flexible piece of stainless steel and some of them will be a coil spring. It's not very often because often they will use just centrifugal force but sometimes you will find where they got helper springs underneath the veins. So be careful when you take the veins out. Check to make sure that on the bottom side of the vein, there's not a spring of some sort. Sometimes it happens. So what happens with a rotary vein is you have an oval shaped chamber. And as the head spins, the veins will protrude from the disc in the middle. And they will wipe the edge of the chamber and it will create a high pressure side and a low pressure side. And the low pressure side is your vacuum. The high pressure side is positive pressure or air compressor. Notice guys, that's a trend with all these pumps is since they have an inlet and an outlet, you can reverse the flow, usually by reversing your reed valves, and you can turn a vacuum pump into an air compressor. This is going to be a common video between air compressors and vacuum pumps because uh, there's a lot of similarities in these. So stay tuned. 
some rotary pumps require oil. Some of them run dry, but all rotary vane pumps will eventually need to be pulled apart and cleaned. See, as these uh, carbon or composite wipers come in and out of the slots, and you're talking 50, 60 hours or so, maybe more uh, worth of runtime, you're gonna get some debris that will end up clogging up your rotary veins. And my liposuction unit that led to the making of this video did not have helper springs. It relied on centrifugal force to throw those springs out and wipe the edges of the chamber. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. Intermittent vacuum like that, you can hear the tone difference of the motor as it's spinning because when the veins protrude and they wipe the edges of the chamber, it creates a load on the motor and you can hear it bog down a little bit. So I knew something was going on and I kind of knew what was gonna happen when we pulled it apart because of experience. I've had to pull these things apart. Now, some biomeds will want to replace the whole motor, and that is what one of the vendors suggested we do, is just change out the vacuum motor at an incredible price tag. No, you can pull the heads apart on all of these pumps and you can clean them. They are designed to be pulled apart and cleaned. Notice that they have easy to access parts. You can obtain these parts on the open market so this rotary vane pump, it was a dry rotary vane pump and it was located inside a liposuction machine and sometimes you plug it in and turn it on and you would have excellent suction and sometimes you wouldn't. And one of the things that kind of keyed me in when I showed up at the room is the doc said that sometimes the machine has less suction than other times. Well, on this particular rotary vane pump, there was four veins and if you could imagine, if some of those veins don't protrude correctly, then you're going to have low suction, at least in that part of the chamber. Rotary vein pumps do need to be pulled apart and they do need to be cleaned. Now these are medium to high flow pumps and reasonably high vacuum. You can easily get 25 inches of mercury worth of vacuum with a rotary vein. It's just, you should know that sometimes they have to be pulled apart and cleaned. Every couple years, you might as well just open it up, check it out. You know, hey, it's a cool thing. Maybe you're going to show somebody new about rotary vane pumps, and you're going to pull it apart during the PM and clean it out. As we found out, intermittent failures on this particular liposuction machine were due to um, some of the carbon composites just from the edges of the blades coming in and out against the stainless steel carrier. They left a little bit of debris, and over the course of... I don't know, 100 hours or so, you know, it all got kind of gummed up in there and it need cleaned out. If you have liposuction machines, if you have large surgical aspirators, like the large stainless steel ones that roll around, you probably have a rotary vein pump inside there because they're compact, they're cheap to make, and they're low noise, and they're very efficient. All right, on to the next one, the last category of pumps. We have gear slash rotary screw pumps. Now they're not exactly the same thing. I know that, you don't have to explain that to me, but they do operate on the same principle. You have two large metal gears or helixes if it's the rotary screw. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna slowly compress the air from one end of the assembly to the other. These are truly industrial grade pumps. They're designed to be left on all the time if need be and they have a very high duty cycle, which means they can be left on all the time if need be. They're commonly found in utility rooms for clinics, some plasma sterilizers. I don't know if you guys know this, but eventually I'm gonna do a video on plasma sterilizers. They're very cool technology. In the bottom of a plasma sterilizer, there is a very large, very powerful vacuum pump. And what it will do is it draws down to such a low vacuum in the chamber. So when it pierces the hydrogen peroxide capsule, it instantly atomizes the hydrogen peroxide. And then they hit it with a radio frequency, which creates a plasma, which sterilizes anything inside the antenna array of your plasma sterilizer. They're a very cool device and they require an incredible amount of suction. So you will often find gear or rotary screw 
vacuum pumps in the base of those plasma sterilizers, depending on the make and the model. But one of the things you guys have to know is that since it's an industrial grade pump, it requires regular maintenance. That means interval changes of lubricants and possibly bearing wear. So if you are doing a PM on those, let that pump run and listen to it and see if you have some irregular bearing wear. You'll get a harmonic or a hum coming from uh, the bearing assembly. But anyway guys, that's vacuum pumps. That's only four versions that you're gonna find in medical equipment and I know there's more of them out there but those are the four that you are gonna see all over the place. Now mind you guys, like any type of utility, Vacuum pumps can be extremely dangerous because once you crack open a vacuum, it's going to keep going. It's going to keep pulling until the, the pressure is equal to atmosphere. If you're around a vacuum chamber of any sort, be very careful because when you crack open the vacuum or if you crack the vacuum chamber itself, it's going to keep pulling until it reaches atmospheric pressure, which could be extremely dangerous. That's all I got for you guys on vacuum pumps. Thanks for watching the video. Please like and subscribe. Until next time, you've been watching Better Biomed.